It's great to be here. And I'm gonna start out and then hand it off to Larry and we'll go back and forth. We are used to that since we teach a class together for the freshmen and we did this project together. So our question is, can democratic deliberations solve our extreme partisan polarization? And we approach this through a method that I call deliberative polling, which is not the same as ordinary polling. It's sort of built on top of it. We begin with a survey of the public, but then we gather the sample together, either face-to-face -face or online, for in-depth deliberation in small group discussions, plenary sessions uh, where the uh, experts from competing points of view answer questions developed in the small groups and the small groups and plenary sessions alternate. And the, the uh, discussions are in, uh, moderated in small groups and uh, permit the participants to come to an informed judgment over a weekend of deliberation and they, uh, register their final considered judgment and confidential questionnaires. So we don't get the pressures of consensus in a jury verdict. And we have large enough numbers that we can evaluate the representativeness and the opinion changes statistically. So in effect, we put America in one room or whatever country we're talking about. And so you might say, well, why not just do ordinary polling? Uh, well, uh, a lot of studies show that the public in most places, most of the time around the world is not very well informed. And you might ask why? Well, each individual citizen can think I've only got one voice or one opinion in millions. Why should I spend a lot of time thinking about complicated issues? Social scientists call that rational ignorance. In addition, opinions, uh, sometimes the opinions that are offered in polls don't actually exist or they barely exist. If people are asked something that they haven't thought about or they don't know, they never like to admit that they don't know. So they almost randomly pick an alternative. I call those phantom opinions. Uh, others call those non-attitudes. But the idea uh, was de um, demonstrated by uh, George Bishop years ago in uh, studies of the Public Affairs Act of 1975 and some other cases as well. People offer, were happy to offer answers to surveys about the Public Affairs Act of 1975, but it was fictional. It didn't exist. So of course their opinions could not have existed. 20 years later, the Washington Post decided to celebrate the 20th non-anniversary of the non-existent Public Affairs Act of 1975 by asking people about its repeal. But of course it couldn't be repealed. The third issue is, selectivity of sources. That is, if people do think about politics or policy, they talk to people like themselves, their friends and family, who will tend to have similar views, or they'll choose congenial sources in the media. They may never be aware of the other side. So uh, we have a system where we provide balanced information that's been carefully vetted, small group deliberation, questions to competing experts, uh, with good samples, control groups where we can um, uh, uh, manage them. And this has been done 110 times in 30 countries around the world in um, every inhabited continent. In addition, in the European Union with all 27 countries simultaneously and uh, simultaneous translation. Uh, and sometimes it has policy effects. I can just manage one or two, uh, two or three cases where it actually has been used for policymaking. Back in Texas, uh, beginning in 1996, we did a series of deliberative polls with the Public Utility Commission about how Texas was gonna provide its electric power. And everybody was surprised that uh, at the public's willingness to pay a little bit more on its monthly electricity bills. Uh, and the percentage willing to do so after deliberation went from 52% to 84% averaged over the eight projects. This data was instrumental to the Public Utility Commission making a series of decisions and the legislature making a series of decisions that led Texas, uh, which was uh, 50th among the 50th states dead last uh, in 1996 to becoming the leading state in wind power by 2007 surpassing California. And it's gone, uh, there's even more wind power there. And the system worked great, except they forgot to winterize the windmills. This is a, a problem which we were not involved in. Uh, it's the same for conservation, which is another way of dealing with the problem. 
Another notable case where deliberative polling had an influence was the, uh, in Bulgaria, where we did a project, a national project about the condition of the Roma and who were going to segregated schools. And everybody was surprised, including the prime minister at the time, that uh, the Bulgarian public was willing to close the Roma only schools, the segregated schools and bus the children into schools with everybody else. And that has now transpired. And our Bulgarian uh, collaborators give us a great deal of credit for that. The last actual case I'll mention before we get to America in one room is um, Mongolia. Mongolia, there have been several projects in Mongolia and uh, it's now required by law before the uh, Mongolian uh, government can change the constitution. They have, and so this is a picture of the national sample of Mongolians uh, gathered before the uh, government palace in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, you can't make me out, but I snuck into the sample. I'm in the very last row, right under the statue of uh, Genghis Khan, who is a national hero there. And the uh, Mongolian people uh, deliberated for a long weekend about 18 proposals. And uh, some of them went way up, some of them went way down. Everybody was a little bit surprised by the results, but the parliament took the results on board and fashioned it up into a constitutional amendment, which passed the parliament by two thirds. And so deliberative polling was directly uh, responsible for uh, a change in the constitution and the law requiring deliberative polling remains. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and dear colleague and collaborator, Larry Diamond. Thank you, Jim. I've just got to say before we move on, the way it came to pass that um, deliberative polling became a uh, major instrument of uh, democracy and democratic and constitutional reform in Mongolia is a great Stanford story because the former foreign minister of Mongolia um, uh, was a visiting scholar <clears throat> at Stanford at our Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. <clears throat> and I introduced him to Jim and then he got very excited about deliberative polling and he went back and uh, led the charge to uh, make it a major feature of democratic life in Mongolia. And now he's the speaker of the parliament. <laughs> in any case, uh, back to the United States, we have the situation that you're um, all, I'd say, acutely familiar with, but I, I want to kind of show you in figures. Uh, as you can imagine, the trends I'm going to show you are worse now in 2021 than they were in 2012, 2014, 2015, which are unfortunately the latest dates uh, for which we have the data that I'm showing you. But just focus on the trends. Uh, this slide shows the ideological gap on a scale from minus one to plus one. Uh, it shows the ideological gap uh, out of a possible two points on a scale uh, between Democrats and Republicans. And you can see, and this is why people say we're the most polarized we've been since um, the late period of the, the 19th century after reconstruction, uh, following that political polarization, if you just think of this as a scale that can range from zero, which is no polarization uh, to two, where on every single vote, uh, all Democrats are on one end and all Republicans are on the other. And uh, you can see that during the early 20th century, political polarization declined and remained pretty modest uh, up through the mid to late 1970s. And it's just been climbing since uh, in both houses of the United States Congress. Next slide. But um, the argument that it's only an elite phenomenon and only a congressional phenomenon simply doesn't hold. And one of the things that Jim and I have been alarmed by, and we're showing you now the same slides that we show every year to our freshman Thinking Matters class, is that you can see from the data of the Pew Research Center, the public opinion data, in terms of the ideological orientation of Democrats and the ideological orientation of Republicans, on a liberal to conservative scale, 
that from the mid 1990s, when median, the median Democrat and the median Republican weren't very far apart uh, through to 2015, and again, it's worse now than it was in 2015, we can see the two distributions of democratic opinion and Republican opinion among the mass public pulling away from one another. Uh, and you can see that the median Democrat and the median Republican now are much more distant from one another than they used to be. And so there's much less overlap between the two groups. Next slide. Uh, and so you can see here uh, the distance in another respect. In the mid 1990s, even when congressional polarization was already gathering momentum, the level of polarization in mass public opinion was uh, not nearly as great. Only 64% of Republicans were more conservative than the median Democratic uh, ideological position. And by 20 years later, that had become 92% of Republicans being more conservative than the median Democrat. And you can see the same uh, a trend uh, among Republicans that in 1994, 70%, uh, excuse me, among Democrats, 70% of Democrats were um, to the left of the median Republican. And by uh, 20 years later, almost all Democrats, 94% were to the left of the median Republican. Next slide. And we see it in voting behavior. This slide shows um, uh, the uh, number of uh, congressional districts in the US and who won them for president and for Congress uh, in each party. And you should note two things here. In contrast to what would have been the case in previous decades, there were very few uh, congressional districts in 2016 and I believe even fewer in 2020, where the, uh, the presidential election went a different way than the congressional election. And you can see that Democrats are basically a party of the coast and certain areas in the South uh, and in the Midwest with high concentrations of minority voters. Republicans are a party of the countryside, more rural areas, um, uh, less urban areas and exurban areas. Uh, and Jonathan uh, Rodden has written, our political science colleague, a great book about this, about the geographic polarization, why cities lose. Next slide. And so we have here uh, a slide from an article prepared by one of Jim's colleagues in the communication department at Stanford, Shanto Iyengar that shows what we call the level of affective polarization. This is the emotional, I hate the other party polarization. And we can measure this in a classic way that's often done by asking people on a thermometer scale from zero to 100, how do you feel about your own party from zero to 100? And most people on average put their party at around 75 on the scale. But you can see that their average level of warmth toward the other party has been declining over the last 36 years. And that gap is what we call affective polarization. Next slide. And so we wondered, would it be possible to bridge the gap in ideological uh, orientation on specific policy issues? to promote um, better, more reasoned uh, policy deliberation among the mass public. And maybe even, although we weren't necessarily expecting it, to re reduce this feeling of emotional um, antipathy toward the other political party by doing for the whole United States what the Center for Deliberative Democracy has done uh, in uh, many jurisdictions in the US and uh, in many countries around the world. And so the Center for Deliberative Democracy came together with a great nonprofit based in Los Angeles, Helena, with one of the leading opinion 
research centers in the United States, NORC at the University of Chicago, which selected our samples, and with the documentary and convening uh, NGO that grew out of um, uh, the uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, although it's separate by the people. And this uh, collaboration came together, next slide, to produce this remarkable gathering in Dallas, Texas in September of 2019, which we're going to share with you now, American One Room. Jim? So we had a sample of 523 registered voters and a control group that didn't deliberate, but in the same period from the recruitment to the end answered the same questionnaire. So this was a national field experiment. And the New York Times did us the favor of uh, getting excited about the project and uh, collaborating and uh, putting the pictures of all the people in our sample, our deliberative sample, uh, in the uh, New York Times, both in the uh, online edition and in the print edition. And then, as I'll, we'll discuss later, again, they did it again at the time of the election because we went back to these people. Uh, uh, and CNN and others uh, covered it in some depth. There's, uh, if you look at American One Room, you'll see a lot of, a lot of material about the project. Uh, now, we uh, discussed five major issues we had survey uh, evidence that these were the five uh, issues the public ex most expected to be discussed in the uh, presidential campaign. Um, immigration, health care, the economy and taxes, the environment, uh, principally climate change and foreign policy. And we had 47 uh, uh, specific proposals and arguments for and against uh, those proposals that were the agenda for the entire weekend from Thursday through Sunday. Now, I had not expected much effect on, um, on polarization, uh, uh, but we discovered in this project that deliberation on the model of deliberative polling is a very effective antidote to extreme partisan polarization. By extreme partisan polarization, we mean the Republicans are on one side, the Democrats are on the other, and um, the people who feel most strongly also uh, uh, gather at the two poles. And uh, so on immigration, where there's a lot of um, uh, uh, strong feeling, look at these Republican changes. Uh, the support for forcing undocumented immigrants to return to their home countries before applying to live and work in the US, 79% of the Republicans supported that uh, on first contact before deliberation. That went down to 40%, that's a 39 point drop. This is really uh, an earthquake in public opinion if you saw it happening in the whole country. Support for reducing the number of refugees allowed to settle in the US went from 66% to 34%. Support for more visas for high skilled workers went from 50% to 72%, that's a 22 point increase. Support for DACA, started very low among the Republicans, 36%. And as you can see, it went up to 61%. And, uh, and support for more visas for low-skilled workers went from 31 points to 60, uh, 66 points, 35 points. These are gigantic shifts with deliberation. Recall that these, these people were deliberating in moderated small groups where a uh, random sample was randomly assigned. So there was diversity in the small groups and the norms of mutual respect um, were enforced in the deliberations. And people came to realize the issues and arguments and implications for people on the other side as they deliberated. And these proposals were not labeled Republican or Democrat. They were labeled just the substance of the proposals and the strongest arguments that we could find uh, and uh, various subject matter experts could advise us on either side and the uh, deliberative poll ma briefing materials are public and there were um, video versions for the less literate uh, of the same uh, briefing materials to help dramatize the issues on both sides. Democrats also changed dramatically. Remember this was before COVID, but the Democrats in the sample at September, 2019, lost their enthusiasm for some very costly and ambitious redistributive proposals or progressive proposals. 
the support for raising the federal minimum wage to $15 fell from 83 to 59%, still majority support, but a big drop. Support for Medicare for all dropped from 70 to 56%. Support for a government funded baby bond, this was Cory Booker's proposal that every child born would have a, a bond which would uh, mature uh, so that um, uh, it, to pay for education uh, at that point, um, that dropped 40 points from 61 to 41 uh, percent. Uh, and uh, there was opposition to universal basic income. Now, after COVID, you know, who knows? But in that period, that's what the people thought when they really worked through all the implications. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to hand the foreign policy over to Larry. Well, uh, what Ben Lai said in the chat was basically <laughs> our reaction to many of these uh, changes. Uh, that is, they're mind blowing. We saw changes far beyond what we uh, expected. On foreign policy, you can see now I'm presenting the results in a different way. Overall, support for rejoining the Trans Pacific Partnership went from 46 to 74%. Uh, but among Republicans, it uh, increased from about 20% to 62%. Next slide. Uh, and then should the U.S. reaffirm its commitment to defend any NATO ally attacked by a hostile force? Well, there was broad support for that already, 72%, but it increased to almost 83%. And again, note this would not have been the case in a previous generation, but Republicans going in because of President Trump's uh, wariness about NATO and badgering the NATO allies, uh, a lot of Republicans were a bit skeptical about NATO, but their support for this proposition increased by uh, almost 17 percentage points to th over three quarters of Republicans. Next slide. Similar with support for the Iran nuclear accord, um, significant improvement in uh, public uh, support for it or increase. But the big jump was among Republicans who have generally been skeptical about the Iran nuclear agreement, which President Trump had terminated. Uh, and that support went from 24 to 45%. Next slide. What about promoting democracy? And I mean, not by uh, military invasion, but through diplomacy and uh, political development assistance, support for using diplomacy and financial support to advance democracy and human rights in the world went from 60% in our sample uh, to almost 72%. Democrats changed very little in this, but Republicans increased almost 20 percentage points from uh, 42 and a half to 62% and independents from 51 to 67%. Next slide. So finally, what was for me for the moment, what was the impact on effective polarization? That slide I'd showed you earlier. And here again, uh, we saw results that we were quite impressed by. Um, the, the main change was not in how people felt about their own party, but how they felt about the other party. And you can see uh, Democrats significantly warming in their view of Republicans. Uh, their, uh, their view improved by about 13 points on the 100 point scale. And Republicans views of Democrats uh, in, improved by about 15 points on the thermometer scale. Next slide. Uh, and those who thought uh, that um, the problem with people who had different views from their own, that they were not thinking clearly, uh, people backed away from that judgment and they came to see that their, uh, their peers with different views might have good reasons for those views and they just felt there were better reasons on the other side. So the hostility element, the contempt element uh, in terms of political difference diminished. Well, and the result is that people left feeling better about our democracy. When they went in before, uh, and took the survey before we started deliberating, uh, only 30% of our sample felt that American democracy was functioning well. 
six to 10 on a zero to 10 scale. And that positive perception of American democracy doubled to 60% on the exit survey. Now over to you, Jim. Well, we, there's one more act in this. Oh, there's two more things I, I want to mention. Uh, one of them is that we went back to the sample uh, in October before the election. This was more than a year later, more than a year later. Uh, and we went back to the, the, the deliberators who uh, gathered in Dallas, the 500, and also the control group that didn't deliberate at all and were just like a normal um, uh, uh, re-interview of a normal sample. And uh, uh, the people who deliberated in Dallas uh, uh, said they were following the presidential election much more closely than did the control group. You see that 85.5% 85, uh, 80, uh, on the right. They rated the government's response to the, uh, to the pandemic much more poorly. That is the zero to four where the, the government response was very poor. Uh, and uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, treatment group in blue, the deliberators, thought the government response was, uh, was very poor compared to the control group. And uh, they also had very different voting intentions. And the treatment group and the control group matched up almost perfectly in their demographics. They were the same people whom we had gone to before. And uh, this was... Um, an astonishing result to us, which we've been working to explain, and I think we've now uh, explained it to a large extent, but the uh, presidential preferences of the delegates, the treatment group on the left, 59.5% said uh, they were gonna vote for Biden and 31% said they were gonna vote for Trump. Now in the control group, uh, the NORC sample got it got the gap between Biden and Trump about right for a national sample. That is, 44% were supporting Biden and 41% Trump. It was a three-point gap. Then there were the others, the people who were uh, not going to vote or the third parties and the rest. The same with the treatment group. So this was an astonishing difference. And we think that the um, we awakened the civic capacities of these people they were much more aware of the campaign, much more aware of the, um, uh, of the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the government's uh, handling of it. And this, I think, really convinced them to, um, to vote for Biden. And the people in the middle, the sort of, the myth, in, uh, the, <coughs> the myth of the independent voter, and it was not just the independents, but the people in the broad, moderate middle uh, whether they were uh, leaning Republicans or leaning Democrats and independents or uh, people who um, uh, wouldn't normally uh, be much involved in the control group, they voted along party lines. In the treatment group, they, they uh, were awakened. People say the uh, thoughtful independent voter is sort of a, uh, a unicorn. You'll never find it. Well, the deliberative polling created a unicorn. Uh, and, uh, and I think democracy really depends upon people making an independent judgment about the issues. So there's one more thing I wanna point out to you in that um, the deliberative polling can be very useful to invoke the reasons that the people have when they think about it. Policymakers can invoke that and have, uh, but um, it's still the people are only those in the sample. However, the basic uh, treatment of the deliberative poll is moderated small group discussion with diverse others. And that can be spread and it leads to benefits of toleration, mutual respect, people becoming more informed and thoughtful citizens uh, and also changes of opinion. Remember, everything is balanced. There's no predetermined conclusion in any of this. So we have plans to scale the deliberation and we've created with Stanford um, uh, uh, engineers from management science and engineering, Ashish Goel's um, uh, lab here at his crowdsourced democracy team, we've created an automated moderator uh, that we've been using where the group moderates its own discussions uh, and um, uh, the queue in terms of the timing of who talks when is controlled by the machine. 
but it works extremely well. In fact, we've just used it in a national deliberative poll in Chile and another one in Canada and previously in Hong Kong and in Japan. And, uh, uh, and um, we're planning to, but it was designed to spread deliberations, not in a deliberative poll, but in the broader public. And so we've been, we have plans to uh, recruit people to deliberate on issues and to uh, prepare it in the same way and to uh, 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 create, uh, to take steps to create a more deliberative society. And we've got all kinds of ideas for recruiting via social media, recruiting via uh, solutions voters, via predictive modeling. And we think in principle, the deliberation could be scaled to millions of voters. Uh, on issues that are highly interesting. And they, as long as we can recruit diverse samples, uh, politically diverse samples in uh, uh, moderated small group discussions. So the ultimate aim is to combine the method of deliberative polling, not only with getting the thoughtful and informed and representative views in a deliberative poll, but also to help create a more deliberative society and that will ultimately uh, be the solution uh, if we succeed uh, to our extreme partisan polarization. Uh, and I, uh, you, we have a podcast about this, which Alice Hugh, or the, our associate director of the center did, uh, which I highly recommend. And in addition, if you go to the American One Room page, uh, in um, on the Center for Deliberative Democracy uh, website at Stanford, just Google Center for Deliberative Democracy, you'll see all the coverage and our plans and also a series of, um, of uh, videos that Snapchat did about deliberation, about American One Room, because we're trying to um, reach the next generation with this. So uh, with this, I turn it over to Emily, uh, who will convene the, um, the question and answer. Thank you, thank you both so much, it's fascinating. We have a bunch of questions and um, I'm just gonna jump right in here. Um, so there's uh, two that I see that are related here. One is um, when politicians and talk show hosts seem to be able to say anything without consequence, what hope have we to operate in a relative foundation of truth? And can we bring back fairness, fairness doctrine? I mean, I guess the other one that talks a little bit about media that I might tack on here is, it seems like the press has changed dramatically and that virtually all reporting now has an agenda. And the question is, has it really changed or are people of a certain age just imagining what it felt like, uh, that it, what it felt like, that it felt different and more balanced in, an, in, a, in a different time? Um, should I go or should, do you wanna go? Go ahead, right? Jim, I'll follow. Well, it has changed and um, so uh, uh, we have a media where so much of the communication, well, as is often said, anybody can be a journalist now. And that means uh, uh, they can communicate without editors, without fact checking. And uh, in fact, some people uh, just make it up. Uh, whatever spreads virally, that's most sensational. So our public sphere has been decomposed into innumerable filter bubbles where people just get the information that they wanna get or they find congenial. So that makes deliberation more important because if we ca carefully curate uh, a good basis for discussion on a highly contested issue, and we can spread that deliberation, and we can also show what the public thinks when it weighs the information and the arguments on either side, we can, we can uh, set an example and also provide um, policymakers with uh, what could really solve the problem. And sometimes when there's a big problem, uh, they're interested. Of course, sometimes they're not interested. And that's, so until we spread the deliberation, um, that will be a problem. But, but your, uh, the question is absolutely right. Our, uh, our, the, the public sphere has been decomposed and because the assumption is arguments offered will get answered. But if you never hear the answers because you're in your own filter bubble, then it doesn't work anymore. Larry, did you want to add to that? Oh, we can move on. That's good. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you so much, Jim. Um, the, uh, we have another uh, question here that says, um, and I'm going to combine a couple here that say, what can we do in our local communities to foster these kinds of dialogues? And are there 
any techniques that I, you know, what we can apply in one-on-one -on -one conversations with someone who disagrees with me politically. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, I'll begin by- Or resources. Um, deliberation is both an art and a method as it's been developed by the Center for Deliberative Democracy. So here I think Jim should follow me. Uh, and what we're trying to do, it, we can use the method with random samples to come to judgments about what a public in Texas or Los Angeles or the United States of America or Mongolia would think if they could all come together to, um, uh, to, to deliberate on a set of issues. Because if it's a random scientific sample, we can extrapolate to the whole public. But we can also just get people deliberating uh, as you know, we did at Stanford University on the new school for uh, sustainability that the, uh, the deliberation that the Center for Deliberative Democracy organized and get people talking to one another and uh, engaging one another uh, with norms of mutual respect uh, and careful listening uh, and fact-based information and all of the other ground rules that the method of um, democratic deliberation mobilizes. So uh, I'll let uh, Jim go further with this, but um, I think the high school um, deliberation uh, that the Center for Deliberative Democracy is about to organize in May, which Jim's uh, colleague, CDD Associate Director Alice Sue, as he said, is supervising, is very important. And this is something that could be done, Emily, in every high school in the United States, should be done in every high school in the United States as part of a rebirth of the entire concept of civic education. And the uh, tool that's been developed working with um, Stanford professor of management science and engineering, Ashish Goel, to develop the automated moderator gives us enormous capacity to scale this up. So I, I would push that as an option. I did see, uh, Jim, someone asked, they know about the high school deliberation coming, and they asked if adults could somehow organize a, a parallel deliberation as well. I'm not sure that's possible this time, but I'll let you uh, respond on that and with anything else. Yes, well, there's this thing in May, which the Berggruen Foundation is supporting, uh, and it, we did a smaller version uh, last summer with the support from the Bank of America. And uh, the, I think it's, this, this will be a national experiment of young people from uh, 18 to 28 in, uh, in deliberation. Uh, and uh, it's as an experiment, uh, we'll learn a lot, but I think that uh, our aspiration is to spread deliberation in the schools and to young people and to civic groups. Uh, and we want to cooperate with those. And we have this technology which we can make available. We have a template. We're also working with um, uh, Larry Lessig at Harvard, who's developed an initiative on a dialogue about the Electoral College. And he's going to use our technology for that with lots of civic groups, hopefully building up to a national deliberative poll. And we have plans to, uh, for America in One Room, we've raised half the money. Uh, we're looking to raise the other half, but we've raised two and a half million in matching to do six deliberative polls with scaling to large numbers of uh, others uh, in the society to deliberate about the big issues facing the country now. And so um, we think for the, uh, we can do six for the price of one. Face-to-face -face deliberation, you had to pay for airplanes and uh, hotel rooms and food and the rest. We can do this online uh, very effectively. And I was very surprised when the Chileans did this um, uh, a few weekends ago, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day, people, my colleagues are talking about Zoom fatigue, which is definitely there, but uh, they bonded so much in the small groups with our technology that they were crying at the end by Sunday night, they didn't wanna stop. And then they were organizing reunions because they were really understanding each other. And this was about reform of the pension system, which is a big deal in uh, Chile right now. Uh, so I think that this could spread 
to the broader society and we need help. We want allies. We're raising money with some success, uh, but we also think local projects uh, uh, can be very useful and uh, we are available to collaborate. Thank you. Um, I, let's see here. So I, there's a, um, a question about how much is racial animus figure into polarization? And um, this person was thinking of the book Dying of Whiteness, for example, which shows how racial fears affect democratic decisions about things like gun safety, education, and healthcare. Do you have any um, comments on this? I, I'm well, sure it does figure in, and it is an issue. However, we don't have data on that specifically. We have data on uh, but that's one of the issues that we are planning or hoping to tackle in this next round of deliberative polls. Uh, so we might be able to say something more intelligent about that after. It's certainly a big, a big problem. Well, and I would say go back to the map I showed you. Just look at the polarization of uh, voting behavior. We know that uh, it, it's massively polarized. Trump carried a majority uh, of the white vote uh, and uh, a heavy majority of white voters without a college education. Biden won overwhelmingly, though I think not as overwhelmingly as some were expecting uh, among minority voters and particularly among African-American voters. And we know that um, uh, racial minorities in the United States perceive the issues and the, just the the daily threats that they face, including an interaction with the police, if it even needs to be said uh, uh, on this day, in very different ways than the average white American uh, experiences. I think personally race is the, the single deepest fault line in American society and the wound that has least effectively been addressed in our history. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, someone asked, uh, is, the, is deliberation effective at changing core beliefs or do the participants go back to previ previously held ideas upon returning to their respective, uh, and they say tribes, but back into their own life, I would say. Both are true. They go back to some degree but there's a kind of a, we're searching for the right language, a kind of civic toolkit, a civic capacity that um, uh, can be re-engaged. And that's what we found in the uh, election follow-up, uh, which involved, was, which was one of the, which was as big a surprise to us and to the New York Times. The New York Times uh, featured that by republishing all the photos and featuring that follow-up uh, because, um, it was as big a surprise to them as the initial depolarization. But on a lot of issues, people will turn back, they will have their own media habits and the rest, and they will uh, turn back. But there was a sense that of uh, uh, potential civic empowerment, that they could think through the issues for themselves, a greater sense of efficacy and, um, and knowledge. And the COVID uh, issue really galvanized them at the time of the election. So I think it can have lasting effects. Mm -hmm. So I guess another question that um, about the participants of this is, um, you know, are people who are willing to participate in this kind of uh, discussion representative of the general public? Um, are, are they self-selected to be more, more open to changing their minds uh, is the question. Well, no, the, the the, there were no differences between the treatment and the control group at the time. And NORC is, is uh, just about the best uh, academic public opinion research organization in the United States. Uh, that and the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan, they're the gold standard. Uh, they do the general social survey. Uh, they, they are the best. So uh, our, our deliberators were just like the control group uh, before deliberation. And they were different at the time of the election. They were different after the event. And so um, uh, I think that um, uh, people did not self-select for being, I mean, we, we, we were giving these people a free trip. We paid them something, we, but most importantly, we told them that their voice would matter in the discussion if they participated and that, that it would be fun. And so, uh, we, I think, had a very, rep we really did put America in one room. 
Um, uh, and if I can just say um, uh, two things, number one, uh, Nork did a heroic job of persuading people to come to Dallas. They actually had a group of concierges who followed up with the people who had been selected because once someone's been selected for a survey, to have it really be representative, you've, you've got to try and really capture those people who've been randomly selected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jim and I went around and, and talked, you know, actually just, we were together for three and a half days in Dallas, just talked to the participants. And if people can watch the four minute video uh, from CNN or the, um, the video clips that were on Snap in the short documentaries, I think they'll agree with us. We had a random sample of America in that room. That's great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Tony Farrell who says, how narrow or singular are the sources of polarization? For example, could it be as narrow as guns or abortion? We have polarization on so many issues. I mean, um, uh, there are all kinds of issues where uh, 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 we've now got not just polarization, but partisan polarization. Uh, as you know, so many things that didn't have to be partisan are partisan these days. Uh, and so um, uh, one of the things that we did was we had people talking about the substance of the issues without highlighting uh, the partisan labels. We did not use the word Trump or Biden or uh, Democrat or Republican in identifying the proposals. We just wanted people to talk about the substance. And once their um, antipathy moderated, because they were dealing with these same human beings over the course of a weekend, they opened up to each other and they listened to each other. But polarization is everywhere. Yeah. Um, another question we have is, someone made a comment and then asked a question if, and say, said, Philip um, Wadler said, if you had asked me 15 months ago, I would have thought it obvious that there would be consensus on following medical advice to fight disease. Now it is highly polarized. Uh, what do your results tell us about how to tackle this problem? <laughs> well, I, we'd like to do some deliberations about that uh, because I think I think we could reach out to people that way. And um, uh, I mean, there we normally do complicated, difficult problems, but it seems to me that 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 there are that there what's complicated and difficult is the partisanship. Uh, the polarization that, that's attached to some of these issues. So I, we we uh, are hoping to do another healthcare related uh, deliberative poll in this sequence of six. And surely those issues, uh, the pandemic preparing for the next one, the, um, uh, the recovery from it, these are all very key issues. So with luck, we'll get to do that. Right. Yeah, and by the way, it's not just here in the United States. Uh, there is a growing kind of denialism in, uh, in a number of other advanced uh, democracies as well. But, um, you know, I just have to say what's distinctive about the United States is that we've had some political leaders at a, a very high level uh, at the state and federal level um, who have cast skepticism on a lot of the measures that the public health professionals felt was necessary. And that made denialism and rejectionism of mask wearing and uh, some of the other public health imperatives uh, partisan in a way that it, I think it need not have been. Yeah. Um... The next question is, isn't polarization the result of reinforcement of group bias? Uh, shouldn't we be teaching methods to overcome group bias to ameliorate this problem? Well, I think, I think deliberation is a method to ameliorate group bias. I'm sure there may be others, but when we looked at our results compared to all kinds of efforts, experiments, very reputable experiments by social scientists to deal with either substantive polarization or affective polarization, our results are just a different order of magnitude. Uh, so I think this is very, uh, very powerful. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, but that's why we'd like this in the schools at some point. And we have done some experiments in the schools. I think part of what's needed here is for Americans to start listening to one another again. Mm -hmm. um, the problem, this didn't begin, begin um, with the social media age and with the hyper politicization of cable television. It began with the rise of shock radio uh, in, in, I'd say, the late 80s and early 1990s, and talk radio becoming shouting radio rather than really uh, deliberation radio. And the political culture has been, you know, in a pretty steady free fall since then. And I think that we've got to, um, we've got to retrieve and renew our our democratic uh, civic culture. And it's got to begin at an early age in the schools. And one of the points that um, uh, the social science history group in the School of Education, and in particular, Sam Weinberg, who I've gotten to know, who's been trying to develop techniques of educating uh, young people in the schools about uh, responsible social media usage, uh, the reason why this is so important is that it's trying to get people to transcend, transcend conspiracy theorizing, rumors, and bad information. And if you don't get them to do that and to begin to develop, it's like a muscle that needs to be learned mm -hmm. uh, or, or trained, the art of listening and thinking and reflecting under what Jim has called in his work good conditions. Uh, if we don't do that, I'd say the future of our democracy is not bright. Uh, I guess another question that was um, offered is, that would tag onto that would, would be, you know, I know you're doing this work, but, you know, are there resources that pe people can seek to online to help them better stage a helpful dialogue with friends and relatives on contentious political policies and topics to do this work themselves to take this on? Well, it's difficult. We have a toolkit on our website, uh, but now we have this platform. So rather than individual by individual. See, I think deliberation is really a collective activity, a group activity. We would like to spread it to communities and to, as a form of community engagement. So we're looking for partners for on, on issues. And it's very helpful if there's an issue where uh, policymakers might be interested in listening to what the communities want. But even so, uh, we can spread it to uh, groups. So we're we're doing all kinds of efforts to that, um, uh, to that end. And there's no shortage of difficult issues around where there's a lot of, of uh, disagreement and uh, miscommunication. Uh, so um, uh, that's the best that we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, so a question came in about HR1. Uh, so with the polarization of HR1 past at ha the House ex um, expected to fail in the Senate um, and many states enacting very restrictive voting laws, is our country headed to a major civil war? Uh, Larry should answer that one first. I don't uh, think in the literal sense it's a civil war, but um, uh, it is got it is fraught with the potential for civil conflict and unfortunately violent conflict. And I think January 6th was a watershed uh, in that regard in terms of the trauma it caused uh, to American democracy, how close it came to uh, potentially decapitating significant portions of the government uh, and the scar it left both in terms of our own uh, uh, confidence in, in our system and uh, the deepening divisions, but also in America's standing in the world. And I think part of the problem is now that we not only have polarization, we also have um, extremism. Uh, and particularly uh, what worries me is violent extremists, uh, groups who uh, believe they have uh, 
legitimate right and even obligation uh, to use violence against property and persons. There's some of this on the left, but I think that, uh, that right now, as a result of the kind of thing we saw on January 6th, and the FBI has been saying the same thing, the greater danger is, is on the right with violent white supremacist groups who, uh, who feel that um, their way of life is under threat and they have to use uh, violence to defend it. And I think uh, responsible Republican and Democrats need to come out uh, very unequivocally against this. And if we don't marginalize this, disincentivize this and punish through the legitimate uh, rule of law system, people from wherever they're coming on the political spectrum who resort to violence to uh, express their political frustrations or their political aspirations, our democracy is going to be in very grave danger. I would just, I agree with what Larry says, but I would just add that we would like to uh, do uh, a national deliberation about political reform. Uh, you can look at that agenda from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's a very good agenda, but something like those issues. And we think that we'd like to both do the national deliberative poll, which can be accomplished online for a fraction of the cost of a face-to-face -face one like we did in Dallas, but we'd also like to spread the deliberative activity to civic groups and schools and have a lot of people considering there are a lot of reforms there are little that could be very useful some of them are a little bit complicated but people can um, uh, take reasoned positions about them and we need a national deliberation about that if we're going to make uh, progress um, and i think we have time thank you very much um we have time for one last question um is how can one sign up for being part of the deliberation process? Is there a trainer, uh, or you know, is there a trainer, the train, a trainer model, a train, train? Is there a trainer, the trainer model that we can scale? Some alumni here have seen that Stanford and other schools are running a deliberative event, shaping our future, and would like to know if they can participate um, or observe. I, I think they can certainly observe the shaping our future is. Um is one of our uh, uh, deliberative polls. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, you should contact the Center for Deliberative Democracy or um, Alice, you or me or Larry, and um, uh, we're happy to arrange for people to observe. Um, we had thought we would spread deliberation by training lots of moderators for events, but the point about the automated moderator is we could in theory scale it to millions. And so that's where we think um, the biggest payoff could be. But there are lots of occasions or places where somebody wants to do a face-to-face -face, uh, deliberation with, um, uh, with human moderators, and that's great. And we have ground rules for how to train those people so that they're not inserting their own opinions and they're being balanced and they're facilitating a discussion. So we're interested in that. Uh, Jim and Larry, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to share with us your research and um, your thoughts on moving forward as a nation and giving us some hopeful things to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm just continuing to try and type answers here. <laughs> My goodness. I, well, you're a better multitasker than I am. I have to look at these. Anyway, great comments and questions. I really thank our wonderful alumni.